three soldiers meet on a snowy precipice overlooking an ancient town. A young woman with no memory of her past faces an uncertain future. A town of innocence poisoned at the hands of a cackling maniac. An imperial general discovers her humanity through the power of song. These are but a sampling of the moments that make up the first half of Final Fantasy VI, commonly known as the World of Balance. A traditional hero story punctuated by character beats worthy of the stage, the first half of this classic adventure is a roller coaster of events and emotions. Anybody who played it, either recently or back in the day, has their favorites. So let's just do some simple exploration. On this episode of A Gamer Looks at 40, my guests and I reminisce about battles, operas, and attempt to bridge the gap between the game's hopeful open and melancholy middle. Time to saddle our chocobos, re-equip our relics, and hope Setzer and his airship are right on time as we embark upon Final Fantasy VI Part 2, Moments and Memories from the World of Balance. In the opening part of this lengthy series, we talked a ton about the game's introduction in detail and in depth. That said, I can't assume everyone listens to everything. So let's recap the episode that was as Ryan, a.k.a. Games with Coffee, journalist Aiden Moore, and finally Phoebe, the Let's Play princess, joined forces to discuss Final Fantasy VI's legendary opening. How about For that? Sure. How about that opening, dude? Oh, the oh, the opening itself. How about that opening? So powerful and memorable. That's really, that's kind of where I fell in love with like Tara. It's just like as a character, just because you kind of see her before she starts to you know transform into the person that she is now. It's like wow, this 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 opening cinematic in a sixteen bit SNES game <sighs> blows my mind. <laughs> it's, it, it's I. I and then the never music behind it too. It's such such a great or just just such a great crescendo of like oh, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Man. I know I'm getting really worked up about this, but six like honestly, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it's just like those are those are the bangers I love the the most out of the out of the series. So I I can I can just go I can go crazy talking about those those uh, those five games. The other moment of just like fleeing through the dungeon, like not having a soft start to the game where you like, mm. you know, like the cliche for for Japanese RPGs is always like you're a villager and you start in your village and it gets, you know, destroyed. And that's the call to action. And and that happens in a lot of games. But like Final Fantasy VI is very different. You start off in sort of this industrial like r- rebel city or like a neutral city, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're on the run, but you're like powerful and regarded as like a, you know, a powerful warrior, but you don't know what's going on. And, you know, like recognizing then that she's in peril and you're like, but I thought she was like super strong. Like the empire must, you know, must be serious business and, you know, fleeing through the, the mines and, and getting to that first safe spot and, and then getting mm-hmm. out into the larger world and the overworld theme playing. And you're like, Whoa, like that's yeah. that, that opening is just incredible. Um, what's that? So, what other um, uh, moments do you remember fondly from from that game? Again, it could be small. How many could people be big. have brought up the the initial march into Narsh? I mean, we, a lot of people have, but I'd love to hear your how it felt when you first saw that. I didn't realize that Biggs and Wedge were supposed to be the bad guys; that they were part of the Empire. Hmm. Interesting. When you first start that, you just think that you're going into this town, but no, they start talking about the uh the kind of tiara type thing that they put on her head that's controlling her you're 
it's really funny that Tara, they know, is a half Esper person, but they don't even allow her to use her own magic. They're having her use Magitek armor. Do, now, I don't remember. Do they know? Because I think the first time you use magic, they kind of freak. I felt like somebody in the Empire did, because why else would they choose her specifically? Yeah, no, the Empire, I think, is aware. But when you're with Biggs and Wedge for the first time... And you're walking through Narsh. I oh think yeah, they might not know. Yeah, they don't know. They they just they just you're just the, the you're they're, you're a new the new recruit the new person. And I think when you if you use magic in battle, the game kind of like stops for a second and, and they go whoa whoa was that magic? Like they kind of freak a little <laughs> bit. Like did I just see something? And what's pretty cool is that you have more powerful beams here disposal as well with Terra, which I think is really oh. interesting. <laughs> Of course, the Empire compartmentalizing information to a need-to-know basis. <laughs> Giant, scary organization doing that? Come on now, stop it. They would never. During my almost 15 hours worth of conversation about Final Fantasy VI, one moment reigned supreme. The Opera House. While it may feel cliche at this point, because let's be honest, there have been hundreds of YouTube essays and articles and think pieces written about this quick 25-minute section of game and a four-minute cutscene that has stuck with us forever. And it does. It feels like it's something that's been over-explained to death. But to be honest, it's for good reason. The moment serves as a character, plot, and thematic pivot point for pretty much the entire game. It's almost the end of an Act 1 if you look at it from a traditional three-act structure. Before we meet the impresario and, and try our hand at singing, Final Fantasy VI feels very much so like a traditional Final Fantasy game. But when that final note is sung, things feel entirely different. Now, a good portion of this episode is going to be spent chatting about the exploits of Draco, Maria, and one very salty octopus. So let's just begin with Julian from the Stage Select podcast, followed by Games with Coffee, the Let's Play Princess, and finally, content creator, Mikhail Casanova. With the opera scene in particular, I always am struck by how silly it is until yes. it gets really serious. Yes. Like 95% it, is... of that, of that scene is a complete farce. Like it literally a, a, what I want, a thematic farce, like just a comedy of errors and slapsticky humor. Or, oh no, I have to dress in a costume and pretend to be Maria so I can get stolen by yeah. the lecherous Setzler and, and I'm going to mess up my lines and like all well, the and... fiction. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, sorry, and also just the fact that like the the thing the 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 villain behind this second segment of the game is Ultros, who is the joke villain of the game. Oh, and, uh, yeah, and just just so much, so many great bits of humor, right? Like, um, again, like no one can know about this. Made a really good point about the the comedic timing of Ultros, like putting his like Phantom of the Opera style. To, like ransom letter and dropping it for everybody to read, but he drops it too late and everybody leaves the room and he's like, wait, no, no, you're supposed to read that drat. Right. And, and then later on where he's like, Oh, it's going to take me exactly five minutes to push this weight and, and crush the, you know, the people underneath. And, and so then the timer starts, right? Like just, just great, great bits like that. And, and then the fact that like, you know, it culminates with this battle with this giant purple octopus on the stage and, the director being like, uh, keep it going. This is a new part of the story for, for our patrons tonight. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's brilliant. And I think that's one of my, one of the strengths of six for sure. But I think the series in general up, up to a certain point, which is the ability to go from wacky hijinks to tug at your heartstrings, you know, dramatic impact. Uh, and I think six threads that needle, you know, the, some of the best of, of the entire series. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and the, the what's lovely about it is, is that you have that moment where Celis is doing performance and yes. like a performance will do it. She kind of starts feeling, putting herself into it. 
Yes. So as you're doing that correctly, you're in. She's inserting herself more and more into this performance to when she's out until until when she's on that parapet, looking out. She is now singing about her situation, and she is inserting herself into it. It's it is yes. stunningly gorgeous. But I'm always struck when I play replay it. The whole thing is so silly and goofy. But boy, it leads up to this really beautiful emotional moment. And of course, the song itself is, it's just, I mean, it's, it's just world, incredible. world class. Yeah, it's, it's world class. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I, I've never seen a, a distant world. I, uh, I, after talking with Mr. Roth for this very, for this very podcast, I definitely have to now see the next time they're in Austin and we'll go and uh, you should come too, man. We'll have to go. We'll have yeah, to I- I felt so bad because I was like, I should have invited Bill to this. Like, because I, sometimes I just I, I forget that we're in the same like neck of, yeah. neck of the woods. Easy right? to and do because we're internet. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. My first Distant Worlds concert, I was actually lucky enough. I I, I was in it was in Houston, and they like Houston has like kind of an opera scene there. So I got to see like the opera performed by an actual like opera singer, and it That's was cool. it was phenomenal. So big moments, obviously, uh, you know, the Opera House, of course. Yeah, the Opera House. Oh, the Opera House is just, it, it's a, it is like the prelude. And I, I know I make so many comparisons to Final Fantasy VII. I'm so sorry. That's but like, fine. <laughs> from my experience, it's just it's just the prelude to the awesomeness that, that happens in Final Fantasy VII. It's like everything that that, that Opera House sequence where Sellis has to disguise herself as the as the lead singer in order to fool sets her and then Ultros comes out of freaking nowhere <laughs> just to, just to just to just to attempt to ruin the day but it just ends up being much more hilarious and more memorable like that opera house scene I, it, it lives in my head and I love it so much and I am so thankful that we are living in a timeline where the opera house scene in Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy VI exists <laughs> because then it, it leads up to the point where you can have both serious and silly moments and yes. then it leads up to the cross-dressing sequence in Final Fantasy VII right. a very silly moment in a very serious video game and I'm like wow. this, 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 is, this is golden we live in a golden age <laughs> Final Fantasy is, is at its best when it's balancing silly and serious, I always think. I and opera, Exactly. The opera scene I, is perfect totally for that. Agree. The opera scene is perfect for that. It's it's this very ridiculous setup, all in service of one very big moment where it all yes. gets very real and I it's one it's wonderful at that. And it does that all over and over again. It's one of the best pieces of emotional character art. I don't even want to call it character development because it's not, but it's very artistic and it shows a different side of Celeste that you would have never seen otherwise. Um, I mean, for God's sake, I have the World of Ruin album that OC Remix put out and the three parts that make up the opera, which is about like 20 to 30 minutes long. I listen to all the time. <laughs> yeah. And then you get Ultros, <laughs> which is just a delight in, in itself. Ultros is just, again, just a absolute joy of an octopus. And I and I love a good joke character in a Final Fantasy game. But the, the, but the opera scene is such a farce. Like, it's silly until it gets really serious. <laughs> until. Yeah. I mean, this like you said, this game is filled with silly stuff. We have Figaro on fire, and what do they do? They bury themselves on the ground because the kingdom, which is a giant castle, also turns out to be a giant drill. <laughs> oh, come on. That's so good. How fun is that? Like, what better way of escape is uh, drilling underground? I love it. experienced anything like that and i don't think any game at that time had done anything like that and it really showcased i think from a musical composition standpoint how with the limitations 
of 16-bit hardware. How much of a musical genius Nobuo Uematsu is? Like, the fact that the music, even if you didn't have the dialogue showcasing, the music told you everything you needed. And, and again, that's just the brilliance of him as a composer. He understands this is the emotion. This is the scene. This is what I got to deliver. The music was amazing. Yeah. Was the And agreed, it's supposed to be a comedy skit. But it just, it hit on mm. all cylinders. It was so good. You know, and I know some people don't like how the Pixel Remaster changed that a bit. I can understand that, but at the same mm. time, for modern gamers you kind of have to make some changes here and there yeah but i enjoyed it i really did i i I, it it left an impression on me and i kind of when i got to playing final fantasy 9 there's also a similar theater yeah Mm because you're part of a theater troupe um similar situation with zadon and with dagger or princess garnett and i just felt let down (laughs) Because it didn't, <laughs> it did not hit as hard. Yeah, that's not much is going to. What's wonderful is that it's when what's wonderful is when she's doing and again, even that whole opera scene where she's singing. Yeah. And uh, if for, for listeners who haven't listened to it, my interview with um, Arnie Roth of Distant Worlds, he talks about that scene, how he talks about the opera scene where how remarkable it was that Uematsu was able to convey an actual aria that he does now in concert with three soloists and, you know, in a full orchestra, he's able to do that same sort of emotional weight with 16 bit hardware. He's like, it's, it's a miracle that it works. And it, you're reading, you're reading the note, you're reading the notes, but you, your brain is filling in the, the spots. Like your brain is doing, yeah, like your brain is doing the work and it's, <laughs> And I remember because you can because you can mess that scene up. Yes. Like if you don't read the script, you can get booed off the stage and have to do it over and over and over again, which, again, is like a comedy thing. So if you don't have Nintendo power at your side and you don't think to read that script and you just jump out on that stage, you're like, I don't know what the worst of this song is. You can mess up the dance with Rolf. You can Mm -hmm. you can do all you can. It's all a big, again, comedy thing. Until you have that one moment where that camera pans out to the left and you see the sun, the moon, and she goes out on that parapet and it is just like, Mm. oh, she's having a moment here. And wow, just it's beautiful. And, you know, I think the fact that all this fun stuff leads up to this one powerful moment is so touching and uh and then the rest of the thing is just fun you got 16 pound weights and ultra shows up and you gotta fight an octopus and setzer comes it's it's all fun and games but that one moment is so indelibly marked it is beautifully done and again that song i mean i mean come on now it's just ridiculous so so uh so if you haven't listened to that episode i highly recommend it <laughs> conversation is music producer extraordinaire mustin followed by trey of the nintendo main podcast and then friend of the show xerxes so okay yeah it's fantastic i'm on the opera house i don't know if i mentioned that before but i mean come on that knocked everybody on their tuckus like i mean there's nothing like yeah, that there's nothing like that you nope. know it's just nothing like it it's absolutely incredible if like if you're any sort of artsy kid at all to see that mm. it just just c- cemented how amazing <laughs> this game yeah, is. Yeah, it's all very silly until you get to that one moment where Celis does what any good actor does or any good singer does is become the character that she's portraying and insert herself into the song. And the fact that you feel that on a 16-bit boops and bleeps, yep. it's 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 insane. It's, it's I think, when I was talking to... Um, to Arnie Roth, I think he, he said it was like a miracle. He's like, it's a miracle that works. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. And and he's right. It's it's a, it's a miracle that actually you're conveying it, an opera, an aria with 16-bit you know, chiptune. 
Yeah, it's just wow. it's just incredible. Uh, and that uh, that um, that opera. Um, if anybody wants to hear just the greatest version of that, do go listen to Final Fantasy VI, The Impresario. Uh, it's a medley uh, that's done by Jake Kaufman and Tommy Pedrini. Uh, Jake is a genius. He's a music composer. He did Contra 4, Shantae, all kinds of stuff. Um, Shovel Knight, that's probably the big one. Oh, nice. And uh, he did a version of it that is basically uh, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. And nothing has ever worked better than this idea. <laughs> Except wow. for the person okay. that put peanut butter and with jelly, that this is this, <laughs> this is the next best idea. So definitely listen it, to that's that. That's the next it's best just, one. It's just incredible. But yeah, it, that sounds really. It's really a cool. great, great scene, and 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 the improvement in the um, the the pixel remaster. I, I definitely enjoyed that as well. Yeah, you take on the opera scene, kinda, I mean, Ultras was always kind of there for comedic yeah. value. I actually just, like I said, I I'm, I haven't played that much into the Pixel Remaster, but I got to the first encounter with Ultros, you know, and in the water and all that. And it's it's weird how much stuff they've changed. Like, they've completely changed the name of, like, everything in that game. If you play the, if you're used to the Super Nintendo version, then you play, like, the Pixel Remaster. Like, everything is so different now. Like, I haven't uh, like played Band- it. I own it, but I haven't played it. Like like Bannon's health move is now called like prey or whatever and, and really and like now uh, uh the science like uh tech moves like you remember how it used to be like a meter that would fill in mm-hmm. like yeah now you can just pick whichever one you want and just use it like without oh, waiting for all that huh? yeah and like and all of and like all of the um all of like uh, Sabin's moves are all different they're all differently named now you know like really it's like like the suplex is called like the meteor drop or something like that like it's I'm like wow this is this is wild. You can't like, change the suplex. A the suplex is like the custom. That's the class, the meme of all Final yeah. Fantasy memes. Suplexing the train. Yeah. Don't meteor yeah, drop the not, train. It's not, no, it's not. It's yeah. I was confused. I thought it was a different thing. I was like, oh, meteor drop. What's that? And I was like, oh, it's the suplex. Weird. <laughs> they just call it's it. Weird. A, they don't want to call thing. it the suplex anymore. All right. Yeah. Weird. Okay. Interesting. But yeah, no, I mean, opera scene. Opera scene. Always. I always thought was. I always like thought it was emotional and all that. I didn't, I didn't necessarily think it was funny. I guess it's like, you know, the stuff that Sally's is doing all that is, is, is emotional, but, but then you have the comedy on the side, right? That's like, yeah. like any good, like, you know, dramedy type movie mm-hmm. thing, you know, where it's, you know, it's, or, or it's like, or it's like the Yakuza games where you can be, where you mm-hmm. can be like serious and funny whenever you want to, you can kind of switch between one and the other. And I felt like Absolutely. Final Fantasy was still, was still good in that aspect. Let's see. Well, for me, I mean, it was like, it was a bit of like, uh, cause it was like, it was definitely kind of one of like one of those, uh, moments that just kind of like stops at everything in its tracks because it's like going, you know, like it's just a complete cha- change of pace from mm-hmm. everything that's leading up to it. Um, there was definitely some frustration as well because it's like, First off, you had to, you know, more or less memorize the ly- lyrics, or in my case, it was just up, down, up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you th- go into it thinking that's going to be enough, but then you don't realize that that also means that it's like, sure, you have to, like, do the, uh, you have to have the song, like, you have to have the, the song lyrics right, but then you also have to be in the correct spot when the music gets to a certain, gets to the point that it's at. And if you don't, if you don't, then you uh, fail. And I think there's probably like two or three times where I failed on getting to the part where you throw the flowers mm-hmm. before and having to restart for the beginning and just wanting to get that section over. Mm. that it's like as far as you know so it's like it's kind of like the a bit of the beauty was lost on that fair sure totally see that absolutely 
Yeah, because you are. It's still a game you have to play, and there's fail states, and you you get booed off the stage, and you have to do it again. Interesting. So when you first played it, it sounds like you appreciated it, but the the, the kind of the magic of it um, was a little uh, lessened because of the friction you had to go through. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Though, it's interesting. Though, though I will say the pixel remaster version of it is uh, yeah, it's so great. It's it's one of those things when the Pixel Remaster, I agree, I think they do a beautiful job with it. I know people are critical of it and you know, it's a classic scene, but I really do agree with you. I think it is um they did as good of a job with that scene as you could possibly ask a remaster to do. I think. I don't think I don't I could I don't think you could have done it better. Yeah. So that's I believe that's the version that could have been you know, that would have been if the hardware could have been, if could have made it happen. I I you know what you're right. I think that it really does feel like an original vision. Yeah, I I 100 percent agree. Totally. you right we talked a lot about the opera house and we will continue to do so as we reach the cadenza of this conversation let's welcome greg seward of the player one podcast and generation 16 series of videos and finally julian returns to bookend this section of today's episode that's cool um so do you remember um obviously you know we talk about big moments and small moments on this show um, what are some of those big moments of Final Fantasy, and we'll talk about small moments in a bit, that, that you remember really, again, striking you and hitting you as, you talked about the opening already, but what are some of those big moments that you remember, that have, like, really intense memories of? Um, I mean, I think everyone's going to have a similar answer, which will be the opera scene, obviously. Totally. Yeah, no, that's um, fine. You know, it was... I don't even know how to describe why it was a big moment outside of the reason that everybody kind of knows that it is. It was it was just uh, again an unexpected thing. Um I loved what they did with um the voice uh, approximation. Yep. It worked. Mm-hmm. It it, it yeah. weirdly worked. Yep. Um and so, you know, having this gigantic battle sort of ensue while the show is going on, too, with, and I forget the name of the character, that that uh, octopus character. That kept Ultros. Back. Ultros. Great idea to have this sort of very minor boss character just, um, you know, harass your, your, your party throughout <laughs> the game. Beautiful idea. What are some big moments of the game that you remember really just just hitting you strongly? I mean, you know, I'm sure there's going to be the first answer of like 99 percent of the people you ask, but the opera. Right. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. that. That was such an amazing moment, especially in the moment. Right. Like when it was new and not realizing that, oh, I should actually be paying really close attention to this script like and not just not just button through it and, and kind of just like read it in a in a in a cursory glance because this is actually important like th- this is how this next bit of the game is going to go right um so it took me a couple tries before before i you know got through the the whole the whole play correctly right. um but and it's it's one of those things where it's it's definitely a you had to be there type of thing right because my super nintendo was singing to me mm. And and that was so powerful and so memorable, and uh, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I was wondering when I was going to cry on this series. Like it's all it's starting now, <laughs> okay. um, and, and it's such a great bit of localization too because they, you know, whoever like like I guess it was it was Tim uh, Tim Woolsey, but like yep. uh, you know, having the wherewithal to actually do a pretty solid job of matching up like the lyrics that you were reading on the screen to the warbles that were being quote unquote sung by the, the super Nintendo sound chip, right? Like it, it actually matches up. Like you could actually sing the opera. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, I think that's just amazing. And it's one of those things where it's like, 
you know, now when we have like full on like voice acting and orchestrated music and stuff like that, it's not that big of it's not it's not impressive. Right. Like to the mm-hmm. point that like for the pixel remasters, they just did like a full on version of the opera in right. in this game. But at the time, like it was it was just so incredible. And now as an adult, like thinking, you know, thinking back to it, um, the like the the motifs in that play are so like integral to Celis's story, like mm-hmm. later on. And, and, you know, and, and the fact that you actually get like, you know, a much more tragic version of her on that balcony in the world of ruin. If yeah. you, you know, don't satisfy certain requirements, mm-hmm. uh, regarding a, a certain character. Well, we're not, it's, it's yeah. years old. It's, it's if not spoiler, yeah. right? Like if, if you, if you let yeah. Sid die, right. Like, right. you know, that, and, and honestly, I think that is the better, uh, outcome you know, just for, just from a narrative perspective, right? Like having, mm-hmm. getting to see that parallel between, you know, her, you know, attempting to commit suicide in the world of ruin, you know, juxtaposed with like her on the balcony in the castle in the play, right? With the same music playing, like there's something just very hauntingly beautiful about that. And I, and I think it, it also gives her like, like the, the forward thrust that she needs to move forward and, and try to find, you know, her former uh, teammates, Right. Where I think if Sid is still there, it's just like, well, you could just kind of stay on that island with him, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's not really a reason for you to have to leave. Do you know what's better than soaring through the skies on a Mode 7 airship? My amazing patrons, that's who. It is that time of the episode again to thank my wonderful patrons, starting with Philip Becker, Terry Kinnair, the aforementioned Greg Stewart of the Player One Podcast and Generation 16 series of videos, Sir Coffee of House Blend, first of his name, The Let's Play Princess, BT Goebbels, Tim Knowles, formerly of The Leadist, Julian of the Stage Select Podcast, Seth Sergil of the All End Podcast, and finally, the one and only debonair and ever, ever helpful Pete Harney. If you enjoyed the show and would like to support it financially, go to patreon.com forward slash a gamer looks at 440. Check out the tiers and sign up today. And if not, a rating, review, or just telling a friend will always be just as appreciated. Let's jump back into the episode. so much more to discuss because the world of balance like i said in the episode it's a roller coaster it is a constant scream until the inevitable end aiden greg and then tim Knowles, formerly of the leadist return to discuss the game's many branching paths and easily the coolest castle i'm gonna say it in the entire franchise the the three-way split where you get to pick oh, the sure. three parties, right? About two, yeah. three hours in. So cool. Like, you know, Final Fantasy VI does a lot of interesting things with like non-linear storytelling. And and the first mm-hmm. act, like everything up until the floating continent is like, it's all fairly, fairly linear, but they sort of like do kind of give you that non-linearity in terms of getting to pick, pick which route you take. Uh, and I think that's interesting because, you know, I have my favorite path, to go on and and one of them is you know way shorter than the others Mm -hmm. um and and stuff but uh but like just giving the player that sort of freedom within the the narrative structure is something that i think was really really unique and then you had other games that sort of took that uh to another level um later in the series um but it took a while you know like i don't know has anything in final fantasy really ever done that again Chrono Trigger did it, right? It had yeah, its really Trigger, non-linear sure. second mm-hmm. half. But yep. um but it doesn't offer you ever really any non-linearity in the first half the way that Final sure. Fantasy 6 does. And then no, Final no. Fantasy 7 went like very linear. So it's like, yeah, I think that stands out as unique and like just like it shows you how big that world is, right? Right off mm-hmm. the bat. And it says here are all the places you're going to go. And that was unique cuz a lot of the time Japanese RPGs up until that point the sort of the, the dragon questy final fantasy ones were always like you know you you explore one step at a time one town one dungeon mm-hmm. at a time and final fantasy 6 was like here you go where do you want to go these are three different adventures uh and yep. then we're going to show you a large chunk of the world uh in whatever way you want and that's interesting to me um so yeah those are the, the three that kind of stand out at the beginning of the game So 
so you know that was a cool spot too you keep jumping around to different characters as well um even more so than you did in final fantasy 4 um but then getting to uh to the castle and um meeting edgar and then having that whole thing submerge in the sand again another oh, big moment right figure, it, again, figaro castle sinking into the yeah yeah sinking into the sand yeah yeah it's such a good idea and <laughs> hey what's the best way of evading an opponent just bury yourself underground and move forward two miles <laughs> that's great and, and going back and playing it and realizing that the the tile work in the castle itself when you realize that like all the the um I don't know what the proper word is for these towers in a castle, but they all have vents on the top and fans mm-hmm. spinning on the top. And you get, yep. And that's the other thing that's really struck me actually going back and playing it because the pixel remaster version doesn't look that much better. I feel than the original mm-hmm. right. the tile work in final fantasy six is incredible. Um, and of course we had the benefit of not getting final fantasy five when it came out. So, right. you know, we sort of had that two game leap. memories you have from that time or of just maybe you you mentioned some small moments that resonated with you um that i thought were really cool like Saban holding up this the the, holding up the 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 roof and things like that anything else that pops to mind as we're talking through oh boy um i think the the gravity of trying to heal sid i think sticks out in my mind um yeah the fact that uh you know in my house growing up, we called it Figaro Castle. It wasn't until I was older. Everybody, Figaro. Everybody okay. said Figaro. Um, I love The that. fact that it went cool. underground was, I mean, just such a neat concept. That's like some- What a cool idea. That's some like A-plus level, like Dungeons and Dragons DM making up a thing. Yes. Kind of thing, you know? That is that <laughs> is like an A-plus D- uh, dungeon master. That is a A-plus DM in a game. That's really great. That's funny. That's, a, that's exactly what it is. For sure. And- and thinking about, you know, oh, refuse ban in three times so you can get the Genji glove instead of the gauntlet. Yes. Glove. You know, that was that was paramount. You had to make sure you did that. That was every a big time. one. I don't know if it makes a difference. I can't. I, I, I'm not really sure if one's better than the other. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> the Genji glove is pretty key, though, for Saban because you want to make sure he can have two claws. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, and that was that was a big boon in early <laughs> game. Yeah, for sure. And actually throughout the whole game, there's no point removing that from him. You got me thinking about it, yeah, though. Man. You got me kind of going through my memory banks here and seeing That's cool. you know, what I can. I remember the, the sprite for Tritok I always thought was really, really neat. That always that always stood out to me. It was just a, just a really cool. neat, weird design that like made sense, but also didn't make sense. Like this, mm-hmm. this unknowable being frozen in ice kind of thing. Keeping the conversation rolling is James and JJ of Retrofits on YouTube, then Julian, followed by Greg Seward, followed by Ryan Lindsay of Kiss 105.9 in Ottawa, and then finally Xerxes makes a return. Um, um yeah, go for it. There's oh, also uh, oh, I was gonna say there's also one of my favorite moments is actually uh, uh, I would say, I guess it's only like a quarter through the game. Jeez, now that I'm really thinking about it, and it's when. Uh, you have everyone lined up and you make three different parties and Kefka sends like his Imperial forces and monsters like up the mountain while you're trying to defend uh, the tree talk uh, Esper. Uh huh. Cause it's like the last one you know about. Oh, that's, that's super early from what I yeah, remember. Cause, cause you're like, Oh, Whoa. Uh, how long or short is this game? Cause it feels like this big, like huge epic moment. And it's really just like sort of your first, dip into the water of just how crazy things are going to get over time in terms of yeah. scale yes. for the story mm-hmm. because it you know it does feel like this big like it's it, it's essentially like a strategy battle like it was the first iteration of the Fort Condor uh yeah. battles in Final Fantasy 7 was this and instead of like yep. uh like RTS units you were using your actual party so it felt like you know your moves mattered like you know, if you have one party that's like your strongest party, but the other two are underpowered, like, can you really use them to buy time if they're like dying? And we, and we got party wiped twice. Oh yeah. Ooh. And, 
<laughs> and uh, it was it was the first release of the game, so they hadn't patched the part where if you hit the wrong button at the wrong time, the battle would freeze, and you just couldn't do anything or go anywhere. So, <laughs> so it, the mu- the epic music kept playing, and I was like, JJ, what happened? My controller, it nothing works. Everything I broke. <laughs> I can't. We're stuck. This can't be how Kafka wins. <laughs> <laughs> Um, man, any other smaller moments that that you remember really resonating with you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I so I really love, and I and I wish more games would do this, but I love, uh, you know, in like the first act when the party gets split up and you get to choose, like you you get to choose your own adventure, you get to choose the order in which you do the next three segments. Um, I've, I've always loved that. I, my favorite part is locks because I love like stealing the clothes off of people's backs and using it to disguise yourself that's and so get fun. around town. Yep. Um, that's a great bit. But yeah, I mean, the, just in those opening moments, there were those big, and I think to, um, I forget the name of the character, but at one point you're on like the ghost train. Mm-hmm. Um, I think With that's the cyan. Yeah, cyan cyan. And that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yep. Um, the ghost train thing was great. Like they really, um, for as much as we got a lot of character development in Final Fantasy four, I feel like they really went for it in Final Fantasy six and that they're, they put you in very specific missions um, that were very personal for your main characters in a yeah. way that they hadn't previously. Um, and, and I, it was, it was just, just fantastic. Ghost, ghost train is a good example of, or, a, or fans, I think it's actually called phantom train. If mm. I'm not mistaken, is a great example of final fantasy six being both light and dark at the same time and having all right. those different flavors, because there's a lot of silliness in, in the phantom train. Like you have, those silly ghosts that you have a ghost pal that can join up with you and he's pretty much useless, but he can join up with you, your little ghost pal. And you can, you fight the little ghost and you sit down and have dinner and to have a ghost dinner. And it's, but then you have these one, this one moment of him saying goodbye to his family after right. realizing what they're, why they're on that train, what the point of the train is. And even though they defeat the phantom train, they don't stop the train from doing its job. It's, it's a very, very touching moment. So Final Fantasy VI is, especially in the early parts, is really good at these. At the Opera House is the same thing. Opera House is extremely silly and yeah. fun until one moment when it gets really real. And God, it's so good at that. It's so good at at at, at towing that line. Right, which is, I think, again, I can only compare it to to anime at that mm. point because that's something that mm. really good anime series do quite well also. I mean, you have some that are really dour and serious all the time, and you have some that are just silly all the time. But I feel like you you get a lot of series, and I'm in no way an anime expert, but you get a lot of series where they can do that, where you have this amazing 180-degree swing, and it doesn't feel out of place. And you do still care about the characters, even though in the next, in the next frame they'll be doing something silly again and they might be like super deformed or something like that mm-hmm. and and yeah final fantasy 6 really pulls it off super well Stall's dinner party oh yeah that was a, that's a big mo mm-hmm. yeah go for it though for you to try it Yes. Top score to get all of the major relics that you're going to get out of it and all the bonuses. That takes some work, man. Like, you're never going to get it the first couple times unless you're reading a guide or something. And why are you doing that? You're not learning the game when you're doing that. Play some fun. Come on. Remember, I'm try was that the same section where you had to figure out the clock? Like the, the clock hands? Um that was that was um was it was it Zozo or Zozo is Zozo. the name of the town. Yeah. 
that like in the world of balance. Okay, got so, it. So like different different area, but like it was the same. Uh, the tower, like the Magi Tower, had this like was the same building sprite as right. the as the, okay the buildings in Zozo. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay, but was a different location. Okay. Do you do you, here's a here's a trivia question and it's fine if you don't know I I don't I you can lie I don't think I remember it do you remember what the what the time is supposed to be in Zozo Oh let's see uh, I'm gonna look it up but I I know two of here. them I don't know it was like was it like twelve fifty ten or something like that All right let's see you are so close. I was right. I, I had the first three. So between you and I, we had it. We had it nailed. The correct time is six hours, ten minutes, fifty seconds. Oh, okay. So six ten fifty. I knew. I knew six. I knew fifty. I did not know ten. I, I had guessed twenty in my brain. It's six ten fifty. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. people listening to this show are probably like six ten fifty. Six ten fifty. Pick me. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. like because it was one of those ones you know because it's like that was one of the, again one of those situations where it was ruined that I knew ahead of time. Thanks again, Nintendo Power. It, like a future playthrough, I actually went you know like I wrote down all the available times. I then went through the town and talked to every person in town, Love just it. so I could you know like where they said that they all lied. And like tried to cro- you know, like cross off all of them, and even if you talk to every single person, it doesn't give you all the it like. It doesn't cross out everything. You still have to guess. So there's no way to na- narrow it down completely using logic, right? That's wild. Because I always had Nintendo Power, so I never paid attention to the NPCs. I talked to them all, but I never. You know, I've never paid attention. There is, you still have to make a little bit of a guessing game to before. Oh, that's really interesting, huh? I did not know that. Yeah, I'm learning lots of stuff about Final Fantasy VI. I had no idea. <laughs> As twilight falls on this week's episode, let's spend some time discussing the fall of the world of balance and the rise of next week's topic, the world of ruin. To chat about this section of the game is Trevor and Jeff of New Dad Gaming, followed by Aiden. Then Phoebe makes a return appearance before Mustin returns to put a bow on this episode. It's hard to it's hard to assume. You say all of that, and it feels like just the later parts, like of gaming renaissance, where oh, they finally figured out the medium. But like again, like I, and I talked about the same thing before. At the same time, we were getting like Mega Man and like Kirby, <laughs> and <laughs> there's just all these like linear yep. jump on thing, grab a coin, off you go. And then meanwhile, you have these entire genre bending, breaking ideas, exactly as you said. Like I, I won, but I still lost. And it's like okay, well, what's the character's motivation? He's just crazy. He's chaotic evil. It, there's nothing. He's just destroying. But there's got to be something. No, no, no. He's just evil. Yep. <laughs> like, and you have to go through it. And then, so just to have, it, it's so hard to think about how old that was. And the and the pitch meeting they must have had in Nintendo. It's like, okay, listen, <laughs> I got an idea. So what we're, what we're, what we're going to do? And then, and then they win the game, right? Oh, no, no. We're not even halfway not through, through yet. So what's going to happen? It's... And then there's going to be a octopus that's hilarious. That you have to keep fighting. There's going to be an opera that you get to sing in. And so the best part is like on the world is breaking. Well, some of the greatest dramas ever being played, but you're like, as we keep referring to suplexing trains, singing operas, it's just all this like silliness that's gone on top to make it just this wild one of a kind experience. And it maintains a balance and it may just, it, that tonal mm-hmm. balance is so interesting because like the opera house is a great example. The opera house that's supposed to be funny. Like that is a, the whole thing is a comedy bit. Like it's, you have literally 16 mm-hmm. ton weights falling from the sky and landing on people. And you have, you have the rats and you're running around the rafters. And then you have this whole misadventure of trying to learn the lines to an opera that you're not really a singer. Mm-hmm. But then at the core, you had that beautiful moment at the opera where Celis, I say mm-hmm. Celis because that's how I pronounced it when I was 11 or 12 or 14, whatever it was. That's how I'm saying it. I know it's right. cells. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't, Whatever language is fluid, and you have Celis trying to having this um, this really emotional moment singing a sixteen bit opera that's like the bones of an mm-hmm. opera, but it's beautiful. And you're reading lines and singing along in your brain. Your brain's filling in all the work. 
So the tonal balance that game strikes, especially in those, that first half, is extraordinary. Mm. It's great. Um, Final Fantasy VI, full of huge moments, right? I mean, it's—I n- oh, yeah. would say it's nothing but huge moments. It yeah. feels like it because those moments are so big. Yep. What are some standout moments to you that really impacted you, either back when you first saw them or even just now when you're replaying it? Yeah, I mean, the end of the world, right? Yeah, yeah after, right. Like, you can't get away from that. I think it's one of, if not like the single most impactful moment in video games for me. Like. It, it dampened the like spoilers, but it dampened the oh, era. Full spoilers, yeah. You know, like spoilers, spoilers for Final Fantasy Seven. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, you know, it's it, it dampened that moment, the era, you know, scene in Final Fantasy Seven for me. Not that I wasn't shocked, but like, right. I had already seen where Final Fantasy was willing to go, right? Mm, um, yeah. Because that end of the world scene, like, you lose, like. You don't lose in Final Fantasy games, right? Up to that point. Like you have low moments. You go through the hero's quest and you or the hero's journey and you have your moments of bought and mean out, but you don't lose. The world doesn't get destroyed. Um and that I think that still is a unique moment in gaming. Like other games do it. Uh other Japanese RPGs, semi recent ones have done it. But it never quite has the same impact, right? Even Final yeah. Fantasy 16 sort of does it by, mm-hmm. you know, like the second half of the game is like has a brown filter over it. But it, it like, <laughs> yeah. but it doesn't change. It doesn't fundamentally change the the exploration of the world, right? And one of the things right. that's so interesting mm-hmm. about Final Fantasy 6 is like it has these defined set pieces, but then they change after the end of the world like the end of the world has an impact on people it has an impact on these communities and these towns and they're physically different in the second half of the game uh and so like yeah i think i mean like that just goes without saying i think Because it's really a tale of two games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. No, that's absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah, what's your take on it? So, you're right. It is a tale of two games. And it's really funny that a lot of the... What the world becomes and the doom and gloom really starts in the second half of the game, even though... The first half of the game is the one that has the most story and development. Like the first half of the game is where all of the lore and character progression when it comes to the world happens. But then all the character development and interpersonal relationships are the second half of the game, which is really interesting. Um, I do like that they hint at things throughout the game, but they never fully state it and you as a player have to piece the puzzle together Mm. like again shadow being realm's father or wait how can kefka do magic well he's the very first magic tech soldier he was the the first round of tests so you actually see that celis is kefka's superior and fusing with everything made kefka a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the game never straight up tells you that. You get to piece that little bit together. And I love that about it. That's a very interesting note, because you're right, Celis is a is a high ranking general in the in the in the Empire before the Emperor. And it's yeah, it you that's a great note. I don't even think I've really hit on that. That's actually very interesting. I think also when it comes to Final Fantasy VI, the, the two different worlds are so are so different. In the first the first part of Final Fantasy VI, the world of balance, 
it's just this roller coaster. Like it's just going and you're on this adventure and you're trying to stop the empire and it's daring do. And then when the world of ruin happens, it just stops. Like it's just a giant handbrake yeah. on the train. <laughs> And the rest of the game is just picking up pieces and doing what you can with what you got. And it's I, really striking how different they are. I do remember that also after the incident with Celeste and then she wakes up and then, you know, she sees Locke's uh, headband and then she goes in and finds the raft. And it's you get to the mainland and it's just this funeral dirge, this organ with this one pretty piano melody, melancholy, just, ugh. But when you finally get to a town and it has this, um, um, oh, there's a great word for it. It's a, like a sad, uh, but okay, like theme for this music of, uh, some kind of hope that you haven't had for a while because of what just happened and then what just happened and then what just happened. (laughs) And then you get to this (laughs) town and you have this music and it's like slightly uplifting. Um, that's a, and then you see people like, I, I know that feeling. I know that feeling of being by myself for a long time and I just can't deal with it. I mean, I would put on my mask and just, you know, keep 10, 15 feet of distance and just walk around Walmart for three hours during COVID just because I wanted to be sure. around people. I need that sure. battery to be charged. So to see Celeste make it in there and hear stories about what happened and other people that she may know, it really gave a sense of hope. I really like that the way you put that in. There's a sense of hope there because you're right in that moment when you're by yourself you know, when you arrive, when you wake up in the world of ruin and you're just Celeste, it's almost like, wow, I'm the o- I may be the only person alive. And obviously, you, don't, you you're, but there's that feeling of solitude, like that feeling of solitude. And then, of course, like you said, everybody the first time kills Sid by mistake because you don't because the game doesn't tell you how to how to do it. There's no tutorial. There's no make sure you catch the fast fish and feed him the fast fish and do it in this amount of time. Mm-hmm. There's none of that. It's just figure it out. And if you don't figure it out, there's a consequence. Um, yeah. The first thing you, you find a town, you're talking to every NPC multiple times. Yeah. I, 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 you're a hundred percent right. Even if you're not a person who does that, you are doing it because it gives that connection. I think it's really interesting. You were able to tie that to the COVID experience where it was a very similar thing, you know, you're all all of a sudden isolated and isolated. afraid to be breathing other people's air. It was yeah, yeah. It's wild. It, uh, poignant is the word I was looking for, for like that music mm-hmm. and that coming up to that to be like this sad, but like not the worst. And, and that's a good point. You're on the Island and you don't know. And after what just happened, you really don't know because the gate you look the gate, your mouth is on the floor. You're like what just happened? And and anything could be, well, I'm, I'm this girl now. Why her? Why just her? Why wasn't I like, you know, if that wasn't your favorite character, you're like, what is going on? If you didn't like, like, it's just, man, it is. It throws you for a loop. It really does. It really does. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> Just about does it for this edition of A Gamer Looks of 40. Just a quick note before I sign off for the evening. If you're listening to this episode and myself or one of my guests failed to mention a favorite of yours, two things are probably going to happen. One, we'll mention it in another episode. I'm going to be doing an episode based on characters. I'm doing a couple other special episodes. So there's a lot of opportunities to talk about that favorite thing, that favorite moment. So if you didn't hear in this episode, if you're like, y'all just talked about the Opera House for half an hour, trust me, there's a lot more coming. So stick with the show. I'm pretty confident uh, this this series will paint a very full picture of Final Fantasy VI. And at the end, if I haven't covered something, hey, 
It's my podcast. I'll do what I want. I'm always down to do an addendum show or do another show down the line. Reach out to me at a gamer looks at 40 at gmail.com or reach out to me on Twitter at a gamer looks at 40 four zero. My DMS are open. Feel free to send constructive feedback and constructive criticism. I'm always open to hearing that while I want this series to be as complete as possible. I'm also dependent on my guests to share stories of the things that were memorable. And sometimes We just don't get to everything. So if I miss something, take the reins and reach out to me. I'd love to chat with you for 15, 20 minutes and hear your stories about the parts of Final Fantasy that really impacted you. But we have a lot more to come down the line. So please keep it here. Thanks very much to Pete Harney and Kev from the Discord for helping cut up the interviews for this episode. Many thanks again to my patrons for their unending and unwavering patronage. And many thanks to you for checking out this edition of A Gamer Looks at 40. Tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a random stranger, tell a fellow Final Fantasy fan. There is some really cool stuff coming on the show, and I cannot wait to share it with you. Thanks again for checking out this episode, and until next time, just be kind to yourselves and each other. Mm